Between Australia and the equator, a rugged mountain range reaches up out of the sea. Few outsiders have crossed its beaches to enter its once dark and dangerous heartland. This was a land of cannibals and headhunters. Its name is New Guinea, the largest tropical island on Earth. It's a land so unexpected that glaciers top its peaks while coral reefs ring its shores. Its mountains are so impassable that a thousand different languages are spoken by the people of the interior. In our next two programs, nature explores a land hidden from the outside world. In fact, our filmmakers were the first to capture a sacred Stone Age ritual. Join us for this portrait of the bizarre and the beautiful. In 1926, news broke in Australia that gold was found up north on the island of New Guinea. Adventurous young men set sail and crossed the sea to a land they had never seen before. They made small settlements along the coast. Few wanted to journey inland, where mountains were dangerously steep, where dense jungle and deep swamp swallowed up the foolhardy, where a man could collapse from heat stroke or freeze to death from the cold. New Guinea is an island of extreme. Just east of Asia, due north of Australia, New Guinea sits between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. It is the second largest island in the world. It is also one of the last places on Earth to be touched by European invaders. The island presents formidable obstacles of swamps, mountains and weather. Only a few men were willing to enter this fearful territory. One of them was Mick Leahy, an Australian prospector. He wrote in his journal, After a few hours' walk, sheer walls of limestone dropped 100 feet. We were devoured by millions of mosquitoes. We were badly in need of a rest from the blood-sucking leeches, lawyer vines, and stinging trees. But beyond the hills, this strange and frightening terrain also holds an Eden. Creatures both rare and beautiful flourish in this exotic landscape. And there are powerful spirits in this forest. The natives believe that spirits circle the sky as bats or birds. or fly across the ocean. There are many animal spirits, but it's the bird of paradise to whom the native people pay special attention. When a spirit wants to speak, it enters a bird of paradise and uses the bird's voice to call to its relatives in the forest. The newcomers, however, saw this place as anything but a paradise. The terrain of most of the island dashed any hopes of an easy exploration. If these impassable stretches of boiling mud didn't shake them up, the earthquakes did. Volcanoes created rows of islands in the Pacific, including New Guinea. These islands are scattered up to the Philippines all the way to Japan. 
volcanoes are still active today. Molten rock churning far below escapes to the surface and mixes with water. The result, hot, bubbling mud. At times, that volcanic power erupts and shakes this island, thrusting it ever closer to the sky. The tranquil coastline belies the turmoil that created it. Consumed with their quest for gold, white prospectors gave little thought to what lay beyond the shore or beneath the waters. They would have found a diver's paradise. For underwater wildlife, the location of New Guinea could not be better. Its placement at a major marine crossroads between the Indian and Pacific Oceans means life can sweep in from all directions. The waters of New Guinea have yet to be fully explored. But already, we know these coral reefs to be among the richest on Earth. The graceful wings of the lionfish are actually sharp spines loaded with deadly poison. Clownfish use the stinging tentacles of anemones for protection. These shallow warm waters are ideal for both partners. Some species of clownfish are found nowhere else in the world. Clownfish have developed a way to avoid being stung the fish does an elaborate dance, carefully smearing mucus from the anemone over its body. Since the anemone doesn't sting itself, it won't sting a fish covered in its own slime. This mantis shrimp is on the lookout for a good home. The base of the reef seems ideal. Not only beautiful, the mantis is well protected. The claws it keeps tucked under its body can easily break a person's fingers. Another creature finds a hiding place, this time in these red gorgonians. Within them are razor fish, swimming in this curious way to disguise themselves against the vertical stalks. These fish have also sought refuge among spines, but they haven't noticed that the spines are not attached to a rock but to a very hungry stonefish. They make the fatal mistake of coming too close. Six hundred species of nudibranch thrive in one lagoon in New Guinea. This diversity is unheard of anywhere else.
Their colorful coats are attractive, and their slow pace makes them a tempting meal for a fish. But looks can be deceiving. The nudibranchs eat coral polyps, which give them either a nasty taste or the ability to sting. The nudibranch is a mollusk without a shell. Its name means naked lung. The feathery decorations above its tail are actually gills. A trigger fish finds what looks like an easy meal. and discovers the nudibranch's foul taste. This collection of sea life is massive, a collage of color and conflict. The undersea landscape is extraordinary as well. To go to New Guinea and not look at its waters is like going to Arizona and not looking at the Grand Canyon. A diver's light reveals a sea fan. It glows a delicate pink when lit. Normally, it would be invisible in the mouth of this dark cave. And near the surface, almost every rock is smothered with coral. These reefs have been affected by the same forces that built the mainland. Earthquakes have pushed some of them above the surface of the sea creating coral islands that have been colonized by plants. These terraces were once coral reefs. They were slowly pushed out of the water by the collision of the Pacific seafloor with the crust of New Guinea. This continuous collision gives birth to the island's volcanoes. The combination of towering mountains and a tropical sea means only one thing. Rain and lots of it. Thunderstorms occur almost every afternoon. In some parts of New Guinea, rainfall is 20 feet a year. These torrential rains wash organic matter off the slopes, down the streams, and into the sea. The abundance of these nutrients fertilizes an already rich sea life. This channel in a barrier reef on the northern coast is called the Magic Passage. The numbers and varieties of sea life which gather here to feed on the passing plankton give the channel its name. Where the current is at its strongest, a perpetual underwater hurricane has swept the seafloor clear of coral. Garden eels have taken over the sandy basin. They're tiny, barely half a foot long. 
They rely on the swift current to bring them food because they rarely leave their burrows. They're quick and with their sharp eyes can look out for food and potential predators. A school of barracuda. A white-tipped reef shark. Beyond the reef, the water drops off several hundred feet and larger ocean hunters come up out of the blue. A scalloped hammerhead, 14 feet long. But ocean wanderers did not just come from below. The origins of these people are not known for sure, but it's thought they came from Asia 50,000 years ago, crossing the open water on canoes and rafts. They island hopped from the Indonesian archipelago to New Guinea. The people today are divided into three groups, the Melanesians, the Papuans, and the Negritos. Although Europeans had known of this island since 1512, they didn't settle here. The original people of New Guinea lived in virtual isolation until the 20th century. While the rest of the world developed new technologies, the people of New Guinea lived and prospered in the Stone Age. Those who settled along the coast would never go hungry. Sea life in the lagoons was plentiful and the crops were generous. Volcanic ash makes the soil extremely fertile and the farmers grow bananas, coconuts, sugarcane, and sweet potato all year long. New Guineans utilize the entire banana tree. They harvest the stalks and fibers and use the fronds to carry food. Eating the banana itself was once taboo. Warriors would not eat a banana before a battle. They believed the fruit's softness would diminish their strength. The coconut, like the banana, is used for more than food. Its wood, leaves, and fibers are transformed into utensils, vessels, even homes. Today, the island is divided into two countries. Irian Jaya in the west is a province of Indonesia. Papua New Guinea in the east is an independent country. But throughout the island, each coastal village, each mountain valley contains a separate, unique culture. Because of the isolated pockets of people, almost a thousand different languages are spoken in New Guinea. These are the Mount Hagen Highlanders. the Dani people from Irian Jaya. Huli Wigman from the Highlands. And I am tribesman from the coastal swamp.
Although humans migrated to New Guinea from Asia, most animals could not. The only other mammal that came from Asia flew. Bats fill the skies of New Guinea. Some native people believe these large, graceful creatures are spirits and should not be killed or eaten. Should they kill them, they too would die. Bats arrived in large numbers and once here evolved into a great variety of forms. This is one of the island's biggest bats, a spectacle flying fox, a fruit bat with a wingspan of more than three feet. New Guinea has 50 different species of fruit bats alone. These bats are voracious vegetarians. The natives need to guard their farms and gardens against these armies of the night. By midday, the sun's heat is intense. Wing flapping helps cool their bodies. Once they're comfortable, they fold their wings into sunshades. They need to rest in preparation for the night of feeding ahead. When the sun starts to set, the bats rise to the skies. Their search for food may take them more than 30 miles before dawn. The only other mammals to migrate to New Guinea did not fly, they walked. 8,000 years ago, there was a land bridge to Australia, the Torres Strait. At that time, the Torres Strait was a great swampy plain like this, that stretched unbroken between New Guinea and the Australian continent. But the rising sea level submerged the land bridge and the connection between the two countries was severed. Many Australian animals were stranded on New Guinea. Immigrants easily adapted to their new homeland, like the wallaby. The open savannas along the southern coast are very similar to their native Australia. In the dry season, the sun bakes the ground hard. Rain doesn't fall for months. The hungry wallabies search for anything green. At midday, they seek shelter from the blazing sun. Even the breeze is hot and withering. A wallaby baby called a joey is born the size of a postage stamp. The mother carries it in her pouch until it's eight months old. Then it's big enough to get around on its own. To overcome the heat, wallabies lick their forearms. 
the evaporating saliva helps cool them down. Wallabies were very important in the rituals of the native people. In a bridal ceremony, a man could offer a wallaby as a gift to his prospective family. Wallabies don't have to worry about large mammal predators like tigers or lions. None ever made it to New Guinea. Instead, some of the largest, most fearful predators are reptiles. This is an amethystine python, more than 12 feet long from nose to tail, another immigrant from Australia. The python lies in wait for its prey, then kills it with suffocation. Remarkably, it can swallow a small wallaby whole. Some reptiles specialize in hunting other reptiles. This is not a snake, but a legless lizard, and it's looking for a smaller lizard to eat. But first, a drink of dew. Skinks are difficult to catch because they're alert, nervous animals. For these lizards, legs would be a handicap. By gliding silently through the grass, they're able to sneak up on their unsuspecting prey. But the predator that rules this island is a creature from the age of dinosaurs. This is Salvadori's monitor, the world's longest lizard. 12 feet in length with fast moving claws and razor sharp teeth, it doesn't hesitate to lunge at prey twice its size. Salvadori's monitor is found only in New Guinea sharing the island with six other species of big monitor lizard. It's because New Guinea has no large carnivorous mammals that these dragons rule on. It's a powerful hunter, but it won't pass up an easy meal like this wallaby carcass. Their thick protective skin allows them to withstand the long dry season in the savanna. Despite their bulk, they are good swimmers and are as agile in the water as on the land. This one uses its tongue to pull odors from the air. It smells a meal. The dry season is hard on the wallabies, but a time of plenty for the monitor. It boldly takes possession of another carcass. The dry season lingers on. Lakes and rivers become shallower, smaller.
As the pools shrink, many different flocks are forced to gather, their numbers reaching in the thousands. These magpie geese are searching for tender aquatic plants. But the herons and egrets are hunting for something meatier. Stranded eels stand little chance against the great white heron's keen eye and sharp bill. During the wet season, the savanna was flooded, but now that water levels have dropped, eels, frogs, and fish become trapped, creating a bonanza of food. and cormorants join in the feast. At the water's edge, shrimp and other aquatic life have been left high and dry. Easy pickings for the long probing bill of the glossy ibis. Many types of birds come only here to feed, like this elegant Brolga crane. Hundreds of catfish are trapped in a quiet backwater and become a feast for Australian pelicans. Working in teams, they're able to catch fish with almost every scoop. In this remote and isolated area, human interference is minimal. Because it's relatively safe, birds congregate here in enormous numbers. But there is danger here from the sky, a white-bellied sea eagle. Its presence makes these whistling ducks nervous and flighty. Their sudden takeoff alarms other birds and there's a mass exodus. New Guinea has some of the world's most spectacular rivers. There are hundreds of waterways, and local people use them as highways. The rivers are natural routes to the interior, and in the 1930s, a few brave explorers tried to use them to reach the central mountains. The mightiest and most traveled river is this the Sepik.
The Sepik River flows across both Erie and Jaya and Papua New Guinea. Stretching 700 miles across the northern coast, it's one of the world's largest rivers. It's also one of the youngest, 6,000 years old. This immense tangle of waterways spelled disaster to early adventurers. They often got lost. One of the first pilots who flew across this landscape was dismayed by what he saw. He wrote, waters threaded these wastes in a bewildering maze. It might have been a Martian landscape with a complex system of canals. The river's hairpin bends and oxbow lakes can still confuse the inexperienced navigator. But the native people are at home on these waters. They effortlessly travel the twisted canals. They fish, cook, and even raise their families on this floating world. The catfish sustains them, and these fishermen hunt for it in the traditional way, stalking it with a harpoon. Lately, they've accepted more modern methods like nylon nets. Besides catfish, the Sepik River provides eels, crayfish, snails, and a continual harvest of water lilies. In the last few years, a fish called tilapia, an African species, was introduced. It was hoped that this fish would cut down on the mosquito population. It didn't. But the tilapia has prospered, providing good harvests and plenty of protein for the river people. On these fishing expeditions, Sepik women are away from their villages for several days. They spend so much time on the water that every aspect of their lives has been modified to take place in a small canoe. Animals, however, don't need a canoe. Comb-crested jacana spend their entire lives walking upon the water lilies. When excited, they blush, their yellow combs turning dark red. The beautiful pygmy goose feeds on the river surface and rarely comes ashore. When it does leave the water, it perches in trees, a trait which is very rare in waterfowl. Life for these northern river people looks idyllic, but it's not. The constant threat of floods, tribal disputes, and illnesses, such as malaria, make their life uncertain. So they appeal to the water spirit. The deadly saltwater crocodile, which they believe created the world.
The Sefik people believe they're descended from crocodiles. The canoe is their link between the natural and spiritual worlds. The carved prows express this sacred connection. These scars represent the teeth marks of a crocodile, but the wounds were made by a knife. When a boy comes of age, he must undergo a ceremonial initiation. He suffers a ritual attack, and if he survives, he will possess the power of the crocodile. The people are surrounded by the sounds of the forest, the swamps, the lakes. Each voice is a spirit. To the people of New Guinea, there is no such thing as a natural death. Every death is caused by a sorcerer an enemy, and every death has to be avenged. The Azmat people live on the southern coast of Irian Jaya. The ceremonial houses are the center of adult male life. Here they plan wars, hunting raids, and religious rituals. Their religious life once involved headhunting, and cannibalism, which they practiced until just a few decades ago. The Azmat are highly skilled carvers. In the past, giant sculptures were central to the elaborate ceremonies performed to mourn the dead. The carvings were meant to incite revenge upon the agent of death. Enemies' heads were hung from these statues. The intricate carvings were never used twice. Each death required a new set of statues. Such carvings were once banned by the Indonesian government in an attempt to wipe out tradition and bring these tribes under control. But their culture is deeply rooted, and their art has survived. The great variety of cultures in New Guinea reflects the diversity of the land. In many places, the dense jungles give way to an even more difficult terrain, the swamps. These swamplands are vast, covering 62,000 miles. There is no soil suitable for gardening, and the small food sources have kept the population down. But one food grows here in abundance. Without it, the people could not survive. The sago palm. To the azmat, the tree symbolizes a human being. Its fruit is the head. The fronds are arms, the roots legs. The name of the tribe, Azmat, means tree people. Azmat villagers walk through miles of swamp to check on the readiness of the sago tree. To ensure a healthy tree, they perform a long, complicated ceremony, a ceremony filmed here for the first time.
They sing to the sago palm spirit, asking it to leave before they take down the tree. Until the interference of missionaries, this ceremony was conducted at the felling of every sago tree. But Christianity discouraged such rituals. The sago exorcism is now performed only once a year. For the last time, the spirit is warned away. They are not after the fruit, but the soft, crumbly pit inside the trunk. Because they believe the sago represents a human being, they use a wooden pounder carved with headhunting symbols to break apart its body. A sago palm has to grow for 20 years before it's ready for harvest. In that time, it lays down massive stores of starch, which can be extracted by pounding, washing, and drying. Eventually, it turns out just like flour and is most commonly cooked as a pancake. Because they have no agriculture, the Azmat rely on the sago for 80% of their calories. It's pure starch and provides them with plenty of energy. If people are tired of pancakes, there is another way to prepare it, as sago pudding. The water and flour congeal in an almost magical way to create a mixture with the consistency of glue. Pancakes and pudding are the staple diet, but the sago trees also offer a surprising nutritional treat. These asthmat men left behind a part of the trunk for about a month. Now they've returned for their reward. The grubs they're collecting are the larvae of the Capricorn beetle that laid its eggs in the tree after it had been chopped down. In a land with a drastic shortage of protein, these grubs make a very wholesome snack. For these men of the swamps, the passage into manhood is not easy. Throughout their history, they engaged in fierce warfare with their neighbors. It was believed that before a young boy could become a man, he needed the spirit of a man to enter him. And for that, he needed a human head. And for human heads, they formed raiding parties. They believed the head was like the fruit of a tree. It had the power to give seed and bring growth. If the head was placed in the lap of a young boy, it would plant within him the seeds of strength and sexual maturity. That's why the headhunting raids were once so vital to the growth of their villages. Today, the government and missionaries have put a stop to these age-old rituals. But some say 
the old ways are still practiced in secret. And what other secrets does this island hold? What lies beyond the coastal territories of the Azmat and Sepik people? Moving inland, we reach waters that run too fast and furiously for even the most powerful canoes. No coastal people travel here. Few strangers have penetrated this fortress of jungle, rock, and water. And at last, we reach the rugged central mountains that have guarded the interior of New Guinea from the outside world until well into this century. In our next episode, we accompany one of the first explorers to reach New Guinea's hidden heart.